And thank you for joining our community conversation, Getting to the Heart of Sleep Across Women's Life Stages, brought to you by CareCentrics and the American Heart Association. We are so thrilled to present this community conversation on how sleep can impact the heart and ways we can help reduce risk for cardiovascular disease through sleep. Our presenters today are researcher Dr. Marie Pierre St. Ange of the Sleep Center of Excellence at Columbia University and Dr. Stephanie Saucier, cardiologist with Hartford Healthcare. It was important to CareCentrics to host this conversation. CareCentrics joins the AHA in recognizing the critical importance sleep plays on one's overall health and well being. Cardiovascular disease, including stroke, remains the number one killer of Americans, and one in three people in the United States currently have one or more cardiovascular conditions. While sheltering at home for over two years during the pandemic, we have put ourselves at risk for cardiovascular disease by developing unhealthy eating habits, not getting enough physical activity, and burdening our bodies with stress. Talking about heart disease and stroke prevention has never been more important. Watching our diets, moving more, knowing our blood sugar and blood pressure numbers, and seeing our doctors for regular checkups are some ways to manage our heart's health. But today, we will focus on one risk factor that is just as important to our hearts. The American Heart Association has added sleep health to the other seven key measures for improving and maintaining cardiovascular health. In addition to sleep, life's essential eight includes diet, physical activity, nicotine exposure, body weight, blood lipids, blood glucose, and blood pressure. Better cardiovascular health helps lower the risk for heart disease, stroke, and other major health problems, and getting enough sleep is an essential element for lifelong heart and brain health. Let us kick off our community conversation with Dr. Marie-Pierre St. Ange. Dr. St. Ange is the founding director of the Sleep Center of Excellence connecting day and night rhythms at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. The overall focus of our research is the study of the impact of lifestyle, specifically sleep and diet, on cardiometabolic risk factors. Today, Dr. St. Ange will discuss her research and findings on sleep and cardiovascular risk across women's life stages. Welcome, Dr. St. Ange. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk about sleep and cardiovascular risks across women's life stages. We all know that our sleep needs change through life. Newborns sleep the majority of the day and then progressively reduce in their sleep through life. And all sleep societies in the US recommend that adults sleep around seven to nine hours per night with an older age reducing the sleep needs to about seven to eight hours per night. Although sleep needs and sleep recommendations remain similar throughout adulthood, the sleep quality and sleep characteristics tend to change over time with sleep quality tending to reduce with older age. Not only does sleep needs change over a lifespan, but there is also a difference in sleep duration between males and females. In general, females report 20 minutes longer sleep duration than males. And this is uh, observed on both weekdays and weekends, where both males and females tend to sleep less on weekdays and slightly longer on weekends. But despite having slightly longer sleep duration, women have reported sleep as a top preventable risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And these are data uh, that were published by my colleague, Dr. Lori Mosca, in a national survey that was published in 2010, where women uh, overwhelmingly reported getting adequate sleep as a top priority for cardiovascular disease risk prevention, even above other preventative measures that are well known, like taking aspirin or consuming a higher fiber diet. And I think women were onto something. We know that sleep is a risk factor for heart disease in along the same lines as other lifestyle factors and metabolic risk factors uh, increase the odds for myocardial infarction, for example. Here I'm showing uh, sleep duration less than or equal to five hours, having a similar increase in risk of myocardial infarction as having abdominal obesity or hypertension. 
And this was recognized by the American Heart Association. I was fortunate in 2016 to chair the first scientific statement on sleep duration and quality and its impact on lifestyle behaviors and cardiometabolic health, along with my colleagues um, from various councils across the American Heart Association. Our group concluded that there were strong associations between sleep duration and various um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And here in the summary table, we show that several sleep metrics, including short sleep, long sleep, greater than nine hours per night, insomnia and sleep disordered breathing were associated with a higher risk of type two diabetes. Short sleep was also associated with higher risk of hypertension, coronary heart disease and stroke. And long sleep insomnia and sleep disordered breathing were also associated with total cardiovascular disease. And as part of this uh, statement, we placed a call to action to scientists to close some gaps that were highlighted in some of the research that had been published. For example, we called for greater inclusion of women and minorities in research for longer studies of short sleep to help us establish a causal link between sleep metrics and cardiovascular disease and also to evaluate simple behavioral uh, screening tools for sleep that would help physicians assess sleep in their patients as a means of, of um, assessing their risk of cardiovascular disease. And we also called on AHA to increase awareness of sleep-related issues and disorders in public health campaigns. So in 2016, my team and I were funded from the Go Red for Women Strategically Focused Research Network to build a center related to sleep and cardiovascular disease, specifically in women. And we conducted various uh, studies, both population studies, clinical intervention studies, and translational uh, studies to really get at the impact of poor sleep on cardiometabolic risk factors. We dug into psychosocial risk factors uh, with a population study, examined behavioral uh, factors such as dietary intakes, physical activity, and their influence on cardiometabolic risk factors and mechanistic studies of endothelial activation, apoptosis, and dysfunction to assess the impact of short sleep duration and poor sleep quality on vascular risk. The next few slides are going to report some of our findings from our center. This from the population science study showing the odds of poor sleep status according to various psychological distress measures in women. And we found that women who reported higher perceived stress and greater chronic stress had higher risk of poor sleep. So they had higher risk of short sleep, having uh, insomnia symptoms, having poor sleep quality, having a higher risk of sleep apnea. Women uh, with more depressive symptoms and lower resilience also had a higher risk of insomnia. And women with more stressful life events had higher risk of poor sleep. So they had higher risk of short sleep, of having insomnia symptoms, poor sleep quality, and greater risk of sleep apnea. From our clinical intervention study, where we asked women to reduce their sleep duration by one and a half hours per night over a six week period, we showed that six weeks of reduced sleep increased blood pressure in women compared to maintaining adequate sleep for a similar amount of time. And we also found that the effects of sleep restriction on 24 hour systolic blood pressure were higher in postmenopausal women compared to premenopausal women. And in our translational mechanistic studies, we showed that women with um, higher perceived poor sleep quality had greater endothelial inflammation, even in light of appropriate sleep duration. And here I'm showing a greater insomnia symptom score, poor sleep quality, longer time to fall asleep being associated with higher inflammation. But not, uh, but not all is lost. We could do something about our sleep. And in our study, we looked at bedtime variability as a potential means of improving body composition and reducing inflammation in women. So we assessed 
bedtime variability in our participants and showed that women who reduced their bedtime variability, meaning that they started going to bed at the same time every night, had a reduction in total adiposity, reduction in subcutaneous adipose tissue, had a reduced whole body volume and reduced leukocyte platelet aggregates compared to women who kept a variable sleep schedule or even increased the variability in their bedtimes. We also evaluated sleep uh, in relation to Life Simple 7 and found that women who slept longer or had adequate sleep, at least seven hours per night, had higher Life Simple 7 scores and were more likely to meet at least four of the metrics of Life Simple 7. And we're very excited now that the AHA has included sleep as an eighth metric in which to evaluate cardiometabolic health. So now, in addition to body composition, diet, physical activity, smoking, blood sugar, blood pressure, and total cholesterol, we can include sleep duration as a new metric to consider in evaluating cardiovascular health in our patients. So it's very important to consider now sleep as an integral component of lifestyle behaviors to uh, improve cardiometabolic health, whereby having better sleep quality can help us make better lifestyle choices, better dietary intakes, being more physically active to uh, impact improvements in cardiometabolic health factors. And with that, I'd like to thank you and acknowledge funding from the American Heart Strategically Focused Research Network and the NHLBI. Thank you, Dr. St. Ange, for taking the time to share your research findings. It's interesting to see how sleep changes over a woman's lifetime and makes such an impact on the heart. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Saucier, cardiologist at Hartford HealthCare. Welcome, Dr. Saucier. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephanie Saucier, and I am the co-director of the Women's Heart Wellness Program at Hartford HealthCare, as well as the medical director for cardiac rehabilitation Hartford Region. Today, we're going to be talking about maintaining and obtaining healthy sleep. So the American Heart Association in 2022 added sleep as one of life's essential eight in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So why is it important that we have added sleep to that life's essential eight to maintain a healthy lifestyle? You had just listened to a short video by Dr. St. Ange, where she explained beautifully why clinically uh, sleep is so important. And I'm going to summarize some of what she discussed right now. So why is it so important to sleep and to have good sleep? Poor sleep may put you at high risk for developing cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, dementia, depression, high blood pressure, blood sugar and cholesterol problems, as well as obesity. Dr. St. Aj and her colleagues discovered through research over many years that women who reported higher prevalence of perceived poor sleep and chronic stress have poorer sleep. Women with more depressive symptoms and lower resilience have a higher risk of insomnia, Women with higher perceived poor sleep quality had greater endothelial inflammation, which is really important when we're talking about cardiovascular function and cardiovascular disease in women. They also found that a reduction in bedtime variability had a reduction in subcutaneous adipose tissue or fat and reduced whole body volume, which I think is fascinating. So what are some of the ways that you can really help to make your sleep a priority? And we're going to go through those. First, create a schedule. Try to keep a regular bedtime and a regular wake time. Set a bedtime alarm just like you would a wake alarm. Try to get up at the same time every day. This includes weekends and during vacations. Scheduling regular meals and exercise will help you to continue to obtain sufficient rest, sufficient nutrition, and exercise. So really schedule sleep as part of your day-to-day -day routine. Get at least seven hours of sleep per 24 hours. Getting less than seven hours of sleep can increase your risk for weight gain, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, heart disease, depression, as well as an impaired immune system. 
And we all know how important your immune system and your health are. Sleeping less than seven hours can also impair your performance during the day, driving, and other activities that you may be involved in. So the recommendation by the American Society of Sleep Medicine is to get at least seven hours of sleep per 24 hours. Give yourself a buffer before bed. This is really interesting, but it's important that you disconnect from bright lights, phones, TV, uh, because the blue light that is emitted from your phone actually tricks your brain into thinking that it's awake time when you should be trying to go to sleep. So it's recommended to turn off all electronics and avoid bright lights, phones, and TV for 30 minutes prior to going to sleep. You also want to avoid heavy exercise 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime. Try relaxing activity like reading, stretching, meditation, and don't go to bed until you're sleepy. Now, what if you go into bed, you're not sleepy and you can't fall asleep. If you've been in bed for 20 minutes and you are still not able to fall asleep, get out of bed and try to go do a quiet activity and then re-engage or go back to bed when you're tired. Establish a bedtime routine. It's important, just like anything in life, to have a routine that will allow you to make a safe, comfortable space for you to sleep well. Also avoid eating a large meal before bedtime. Reserve your bed. So this may sound silly, but don't go to your bed to hang out, watch TV, or you know, do work. Make sure you avoid all electronics when in bed and keep your bed reserved for sleeping and sex. That's what your bed should be used for. And if you're going to be doing other activities, find an alternative location. That allows your body and your mind to know that when I'm in bed, I'm ready for sleeping. Avoid alcohol and excessive caffeine. Alcohol can disturb your sleep and reduce your sleep quality. So it's recommended not to drink alcohol within three hours of bedtime. Caffeine can also disrupt sleep if taking an excess or too close to bedtime. Now, this is um, in lieu of actually a nap though. Some people can nap and have a cup of tea or coffee before their nap, allowing for some refreshed, more awake time following the nap. Now, again, that is during a nap time, during a wake cycle. That is not an increased dose of caffeine before bed. That's what you really wanna avoid. Make your sleep space a sanctuary. So dark, quiet environments can help you sleep better. Remove clutter. Cover the windows, keep electronics powered off. You're gonna see that that's an ongoing theme through my talk today. Keep your bedroom at a comfortable temperature that you're comfortable sleeping at. Stay active. Outdoor activities timed during your wake period can actually help you maintain your body's sleep-wake cycle. Exercising 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise minimum per week is what's recommended by the American Heart Association. And that's actually part of the Life's Essential Eights is exercise. And we incorporate it here because the exercise will also help you with your sleep. Shift work and sleep. So you may say, you know, I don't have a normal sleep schedule. What can I do? So the reason why shift work and sleep is so important is because misalignment of the endogenous circadian rhythm, as well as work cycles, can occur and can cause sleep disturbances. Those on rotating schedules may experience more difficulty sleeping, difficulty falling asleep or longer sleep latency, increased nighttime awakenings, excessive sleepiness, more work-related um, accidents, chronic partial sleep deprivation may also occur. What has been found and recommended, again, by the American Association of Sleep Medicine, is that if you're on a rotating schedule, rotating from day to evening to night is actually easier for the body to adapt to than the other way around. So rotating from night to evening to day is much harder. So doing a clockwise day to evening to night rotation of schedule is actually recommended. Studies have also shown that older um, shift workers aged 53 to 59 are tend to be more sleepy than younger shift workers and don't tolerate that shift work as well. In another study looking at um, medical residents and sleep deprivation and shift work, they found that there's 18% increase in errors in afternoon shifts 
and an increase in human errors by 30% on night shifts. And that's why it's so important that we're addressing sleep and making sure to get good sleep, even if you are a shift worker. So how can we help our shift workers? Recommend again, a day to evening to night rotating schedule. Limit night shifts to blocks of three. Limit shift duration to eight hours. Allow three days of recuperation after a night shift. Protect sleep time. You can also have structured naps, no longer than 30 minutes. So naps less than 30 minutes are recommended. Avoiding caffeine in the second half of the shift. And wearing sunglasses on the ride home to help your body start to get into that. It's time to go to sleep dark circadian rhythm. Melatonin can also help shift circadian rhythms. What about insomnia? Someone might say, I have to count sheep every single night and I just can't fall asleep. So what is insomnia? It's frequent and persistent difficulty or initiating or sustaining sleep. Patients who have insomnia often have sleep dissatisfaction and they have impaired daytime functioning. To diagnose insomnia, you have to have three times per week for at least three months of difficulty persisting and initiating or sustaining sleep. About 33% of adults experience insomnia at least intermittently. That's a third of the population. That's a lot of people. It can reduce life expectancy having chronic insomnia. It can affect daily activities like motivation, road safety or driving, personal relationships, judgment, as well as performance. Symptoms of um, insomnia can also be related to symptoms of other disease processes, such as depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. And there are some other disorders that also can mimic insomnia, such as restless leg syndrome, stress, sleep apnea, and different medication use. Now, what about obstructive sleep apnea? So when someone says, oh my goodness, I hear you stop breathing multiple times a night or you snore a lot, things that your doctor is gonna start thinking about is maybe you have obstructive sleep apnea. And obstructive sleep apnea is characterized by complete or partial airway closure during sleep. Obesity places patients at a higher risk of sleep apnea. However, patients with sleep apnea also tend to gain more weight. So it tends to be this vicious cycle. Sleep apnea can also cause hypertension, increased risk of stroke, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm, and coronary heart disease. Studies have shown that compliance with CPAP, which is a treatment for sleep apnea, improves the hunger hormone imbalance. And so for those people who are like, I am just always hungry, sleep apnea is actually tied in with that. And that's why there's this connection with obesity and um, sleep apnea as well. Weight loss is one of the first recommended treatments for obstructive sleep apnea, as well as CPAP therapy. Those are standard. However, a referral to a sleep center may be necessary. So all of these things are really important to obtain great sleep and to make sure that you're taking part of life's eight essentials. So in summary, sleeping at least seven hours a night is key to a healthy lifestyle. Make small, tangible changes to allow for healthy sleep. And remember, poor sleep is related to increased cardiovascular risk and disease. And if you're trying lifestyle modifications but still having trouble, make sure you seek expert care. Be evaluated by your primary care physician, your cardiologist, and you may need a referral to a sleep center where you have people who are experts in helping you maintain and obtain a really healthy sleep cycle. So with that, I'm going to close. I'm going to thank you all. I'm going to leave you with a beautiful sunset from Santorini. Um, and I hope that you all have a wonderful night's sleep. Thank you, Dr. Saucier. Everything you discussed today is so relevant to all of us and what we can incorporate into our lives in an effort to have quality sleep and a healthy heart. I hope you enjoyed our presentation today. Our speakers were so informative and provided great information on how sleep can impact our heart and what we can do to lower our risk. On behalf of CareCentrics, I thank you for joining us and thank you to the American Heart Association for this opportunity. Be well.